Testing, testing. Hi, good morning, everyone. On behalf of all Singaporeans, I would like to extend a warm welcome uh, to Singapore. Yay! <laughs> I hope everyone has had a lovely evening yesterday and are now very well rested. For those of you joining us online, thank you very much and a warm welcome to you as well. This morning, we are very honoured to have our keynote speaker, Mr. Kyok Siang Yo, Senior Director of the Heritage Policy from the National Heritage Board of Singapore to talk about safeguarding the intangible cultural heritage of Singapore. Mr. Kirk is the first Singaporean to be appointed to UNESCO's evaluation body for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage. He will not only share his insights and experiences, but also challenges and opportunities on how to safeguard and promote intangible cultural heritage in the digital era. Without much further ado, let's welcome Mr. Kirk. Thank you, Alan. And um, first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at the Wikimania here in Singapore. It's really an honor to join you. And a big hello to those who are joining us online as well. Um, so I work at the National Heritage Board. Um, we do all kinds of work related to heritage in Singapore. We have uh, museums and we put up exhibitions to tell the Singapore story. We work with communities in many of our work that we do in projects. Uh, we preserve both the physical, historic buildings and monuments, as well as uh, safeguard intangible cultural heritage. We manage uh, collections of objects, maps, documents that tell the Singapore history, the Singapore story. And also we work with partners to help build their capabilities to partner with them in many of the projects that we do. When I first joined the National Heritage Board, a pretty senior um, civil servant once told me there's two jobs that he would like to be in. One is to the preserving nature and the environment because it's such a precious resource um, that the world is to us, that we live in. But the second area that he spoke about is the job that I have in the area of cultural heritage because culture and heritage is about the people it's about what our forefathers have passed on to us and inherited from them. And we have a duty to pass on to the next generation. And culture and heritage is a very important resource that identifies who we are as a person, as an individual, as a community. And it helps bring people together through understanding one another's culture, uh, religion, and beliefs. And I think in today's interconnected world, it is so important we see so much division in our societies today, so much conflict, so much disagreement, so much tribal differences. And I truly believe that the work of culture can really bring people together to help transform and shape societies, as what the UNESCO quotation here highlights. And today, my presentation is about living heritage, about intangible cultural heritage. And it's also in line with Wiki Loves Living Heritage Movement, as well as in celebration of the UNESCO, 20th anniversary of the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. Now, I've used this term so much, I really want to go in depth and explain a little bit more. What is intangible cultural heritage all about? It's also called living heritage, and it's all the songs, the traditional songs, the, the expressions, traditional dances, the clothing that we wear, the traditional wear, traditional crafts, um, festivals that we see and, and practice, and also the food that we consume and eat that's been passed down from, from one generation to another. And in contrast, tangible heritage is things that are physical in nature, things that like our historic monuments, some of you may have visited the Botanic Gardens, which is a World Heritage Site here in Singapore. And there are other things like the collections of historic objects. Those are physical, tangible objects. But the intangible is really about the cultural expressions and the knowledge that people have among themselves, the skills that they possess, that has been passed down from one generation to the other. We call it a living heritage because it evolves over time. 
with people's creativity, innovation, the response to the, um, the environment, the economic situation, the tastes and preferences of people at that time. All these forms of living heritage give us a sense of identity and define who we are. And it's so important to various communities around the world. And UNESCO has various lists. One of the more uh, well-known lists is the representative list of intangible cultural heritage. And I have some examples uh, on the screen here. Reggae music, which many of you will know, uh, is very dear to the hearts of Jamaicans, and they have celebrated and nominated it successfully to the UNESCO list back in 2018. Uh, Pantun, closer to Singapore and our neighbors, uh, Pantun is a poetic expression. It's found in Indonesia and Malaysia. And those of you who are from the uh, Scandinavia region, uh, which has a rich, uh, diverse heritage, particularly in the marine time heritage, they have nominated together um, with a collective of countries the boat, clicker boat traditions. So these are all forms of re representative um, intangible cultural heritage that uh, we celebrate in the world. And in the, the safeguarding, the transmission of culture and heritage, the communities play a very, very important role. Uh, here is a um, citation from the UNESCO Convention that recognizes that communities, in particular indigenous communities, uh, play an important role in the production, in the safeguarding, the maintenance, and the recreation of intangible cultural heritage. And all this helps to add to the cultural diversity that we enjoy and we see today in the world. Now, I often, in my course of work, get a lot of uh, questions about you know, what exactly is intangible cultural heritage. It's hard to understand. It's, it's so nebulous and, and hard to see. It's really, truly intangible. Uh, and I just want to explain a few concepts uh, here that guide the work that we do. Uh, I often say that it's traditional, contemporary, and living at the same time. That sounds a bit contradictory, but it's true because if you think about it, these are traditions that have been passed down to us. It's contemporary because it's still relevant in today's society, and it's still living because it evolves. Someone comes along and decides to change or decides to introduce some new way of doing things. And for example, we also have like urban or rural traditions and practices that have evolved over time as more and more people settle and move into urban environments. I often get a question as well that, you know, the traditions that we see now, the food that we enjoy today, the practices and the traditional dances that we see are not really authentic. They're not the same as I remember growing up. But my response to them is, we shouldn't be talking about authenticity or trying to freeze a practice in time. Why do we call it a living heritage? Because it evolves over time and it, res uh, it responds to people, the practitioners, they innovate, they respond, they adapt, and it's no one single form of practice. And we should celebrate the diversity of practices that can be found. Another very popular question that I have is, oh, this is not original, this is, not, this is from a country A, and it's, why are you claiming it as, a, as from your country? It's not about claiming ownership, it's not about trying to define who owns what cultural heritage. We believe that culture is shared, and living culture heritage especially, because it resides in the minds and the knowledge of people, it moves with the people when people move to different areas because of work, because of trade, to find a new form of living, or perhaps they have no choice, they were forced to move. They bring along their cultural heritage. They bring along their crafts, the dressing, the food that they consume. Many of these practices have moved even beyond before national boundaries of today were formed. Now here in Singapore, I hope you all have a chance to see and experience the diversity of cultures that we have in Singapore. I just want to show you a few in the photos, like lion dance, the cuisines. Uh, yesterday, I, I noticed one of the dancers were, was, was uh, dressed in the same as the one, the Jigli Nona song and Brayo dance that I have in the picture. And we also have orchid cultivation, which is an important uh, national flower of Singapore as well. 
Uh, but as with many areas of work, uh, as with different forms of heritage, we face many challenges in terms of preserving and uh, safeguarding our living heritage. Firstly, it's about urbanization. More than half or perhaps two thirds of the world today live in, in um, urban environments. And the shift between the rural environment when people shift and the rapid urbanization, which we have felt here in Singapore, and it's also true in many cities and many regions around the world, is that it disrupts the flow of and the practice of, um, of uh, living heritage, how it's practiced in the past, uh, and they have to adapt to different situations, different environments completely. There are other major factors at place, globalization, trade, advance in technology, changing lifestyles. All these changes the way that we consume cultural heritage, the way that we consume uh, goods, services, the way that we entertain ourselves is very different from uh, our forefathers. In Singapore, we have another challenge, which is the aging, rapidly aging population. And coupled with that, young people today have such, in Singapore have such a variety of jobs that they can turn to. Um, many of them would like to prefer in an aircon environment, high paying office job. Uh, but that poses a challenge to many of our practitioners, the challenge of transmission. If no one comes forward to learn the practice, to continue the heritage, then this will disappear. As we are living heritage, it may die over time. Here are two examples of practitioners here in Singapore that we have been working with. Mr. Jim Wong, one of the last traditional paper lantern makers here in Singapore. Uh, and Mr. Henry Ng on the right side of the photo, the last traditional lion head craftsman in Singapore. Both are very skilled in their practice, but both of them face challenges in getting a younger practitioner, a younger disciple to come over to learn from them and to carry on the trade. So this is an important area that we are trying to tackle, and I'll share more a bit in the later part of my slides. But right now, I'd like to move to some of the efforts that we've been trying to do here in Singapore to safeguard our intangible cultural heritage. The first area I'd like to talk about is the inventory. UNESCO encourages countries to develop inventories and communities as well to develop them because this helps to uh, get people to understand and appreciate what are the diverse cultures that they can find in Singapore, uh, in, in their respective countries. And here in Singapore, we have an online uh, inventory that um, classifies and um, categorizes the different practices, the food heritage. And this is like a web-based inventory with images, videos. Uh, we also feature the experiences and the stories of the practitioners to help people to better understand um, the living heritage. And this is a useful resource for many people, for researchers, for students especially, um, to try to understand and do projects, to inspire and help them do projects in this area of ICH as well. Of course, we work with Wiki. We are very happy to be partners in the Wiki Loves Living Heritage in Singapore. And um, there are some of the photos um, that are on display, shortlisted, and do uh, go and vote. Uh, we were happy with the, press, um, the partnership because it really encourages communities to come forward, um, to contribute uh, in a way to you know, spreading the knowledge and the understanding and appreciation of, of heritage. And we are really looking forward to more partnerships with the Wiki, our partners as well, in the uh, months ahead. Another way that we've tried to work with citizens uh, is this citizen engagement project that we try to get them to map heritage businesses. We didn't want people just to be passive consumers of knowledge, to just learn or to just go to the shops. We wanted them to be part of this process of you know, keeping our cultural heritage alive. So we recruited volunteers, we did a public call out, and many people stepped forward uh, to be trained, to do interviews, to collect the stories of the heritage businesses in the Kampong Glam area, which is a historic precinct here in Singapore. Uh, and it's really uh, been a very encouraging response from the, the volunteers, the, the, the passion that they have, um, the love for the district. It's very encouraging to see. And so the, the findings have been converted into a booklet as well as an online map um, to share more stories uh, with other people. And we hope to do more of such uh, mapping projects in other areas of Singapore as well. Uh, other ground up projects that we support include research projects, 
uh, supporting workshops to train or to get to get pass on knowledge. Uh, publications that help document different forms of heritage here. Uh, example of a publication about food heritage in Singapore. We also gave out awards. This is called the Stewards of Intangible Cultural Heritage Award to try to recognize practitioners who have dedicated so much of their life, their passion and energies to keeping the traditions alive and keeping them and transmitting them to the next generation. We give them a small financial grant to help support grounds up efforts um, that they have in the future to help spread the word and knowledge as well. Now I'll move on to a more um, international part of what we do. Um, one of the things that we, I have the privilege of working on was the nomination of the hawker culture here in Singapore to the UNESCO representative list. And this was successfully inscribed on the representative list of UNESCO back in December 2020. Now, thank you, thank you so much. For those of you who may not be familiar with uh, hawker culture here in Singapore, and for those of you who are visiting Singapore, please go and try it. There's nothing like re experiencing the real thing. But we talk about hawker culture in three aspects. The people, the hawkers who are you know, culinary masters that have learned how to, the skills, often from their, their parents, um, and also about the people who visited the, visit the hawker centers. Hawker centers are these um, open air, um, vented, open ventilated um, community dining spaces that spread across the island. And it's a place where you can find a variety of food uh, from different cuisines. Uh, and the cuisine itself represents the diversity of cultures that we have here in Singapore. When we first started um, this effort to think of what we could be nominating to UNESCO as the first uh, item, we did a lot of consultation, uh, focus group discussions, meeting people, cultural practitioners, experts, academics, and we asked them, um, you know, what do you think should be something that um, we should celebrate, we should preserve for our future generations, we should you know, nominate to UNESCO to help support our, our, our efforts. And I think it was very interesting to see that because Singaporeans love our food so much, I think the choice became clear that they, they were hoping, uh, they were asking us to help nominate hawker culture to UNESCO. So once we, 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 we decided to, to put in an effort to nominate to UNESCO, we worked with many different community groups here are some photos of working with the associations to promote the nomination effort. Uh, we went out to schools, to, to hawker centers to promote it, to get people to understand what this intangible cultural heritage is about, help, help to support this nomination effort. Uh, we were very heartened that many people, including many of the hawkers, came forward to support this nomination very passionately. Many different organizations, groups, youth groups came forward to support as well. We had celebrities, well-known figures in, in Singapore supporting. Also many of our overseas Singaporeans who miss home you know, supported the, the effort as well because food helps to bring a connection back home here in Singapore. Um, we have many young students, youths coming on board as well in different ways through technology projects, through art, drawings, um, the, the picture, the, the right bottom shows a group of primary school students going to their neighborhood to interview the hawkers, to get the stories, to get to know the hawkers in their neighborhood small. Uh, people from all walks of life were just so um, happy to support this effort as well. They penned down uh, notes, short notes uh, on social media as well to celebrate the nomination effort. So we were all really very heartened by the outpouring of uh, support that Singaporeans gave to the nomination. I move on to a second project that I've been working on, and this is the multi-nomination of kabaya. Kabaya is a traditional women's attire you will see in the photos. And also some of the ladies yesterday were dressed in kabaya as well. Uh, this is a multinational nomination involving five countries, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. It's a joint effort not just from the government departments of the countries, but also involving communities and experts who have come together to help shape the nomination form to look at the documents to be provided to UNESCO. So we have submitted all the documents and the forms that are necessary, and we're looking forward to a positive results, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, which will be known in uh, the end of 2024. 
Now, here in Singapore, we set about en engaging our local communities. It's a very small, uh, very niche community, but a very important one because um, it defines really the traditional way of women. Um, and we work with many um, designers, craftspersons, students, educators, youths, and we form a network, a loose network called um, Kawan Kabaya, which is literally translated Friends of Kabaya. And they help you know, to share more information, their insights, their stories, their ideas on how we can continue this practice, how we can encourage uh, more practitioners to come on board, more young Singaporeans to start wearing the traditional garment, and so on. So this was a very interesting experience as well at the domestic level, but also at the international level, we got to meet uh, many people. It was very good to see many people coming um, together to work on this project. Um, myself and a few others from Singapore, we attended workshops in Malaysia, in Jakarta, Indonesia, as well as online over Zoom um, to try to collectively put together all the information that's required the photos, the videos, the, the information, the letters, the photos, and so on, um, to UNESCO. Um, in Singapore, we also ran digital campaigns to try to promote the nomination effort uh, through social media. Uh, we also have a Love Kabaya traveling exhibition, a small exhibition that talks about the Kabaya and the nomination effort. But it's also what's interesting is many of the craftsperson came on board and there are creations of Kabaya are also featured in the exhibition as well. And if you have a chance to visit uh, Gardens by the Bay, do take a look at the exhibitions there. Uh, it's just both the orchids from the region as well as the kabayas that are on display there at the moment. Uh, last part of this presentation talking about the f is talking about the future. Uh, we have recently, this year, launched our SG Heritage Plan, which is a plan that guides the strategies, the action plans for the next five years from this year to 2024. And this was done in collaboration and consultation with many stakeholders through many focus groups. And we even have online websites and this small little booth that you can see in the photo that shows a physical booth, get people to you know, give their suggestions and ideas. And the whole plan is very detailed. You can Google it, you'll probably find it. Perhaps it should be listed on Wiki as well. Um, we came out with four areas of um, focus. First is about heritage identity. How do we create more awareness, more uh, deep sense of our cultural heritage as part of our identity as Singaporeans? Um, secondly is working with communities. How we can work more with communities, partner with them, get them involved in many of the work that we do. Heritage and industry is the third area. Talking about how do we get and uh, our businesses involved? How do we preserve and encourage the sustainability of our businesses? as well as her heritage and innovation. How do we do uh, work with uh, uh, incorporate technology in the way that we work? So I'll just touch on two areas. Firstly, is about the community. I think what we want to do is to develop more common ground across communities to empower and encourage more Singaporeans to come forward, to tell the stories, to tell the stories that, that present who we are as a people, to tell stories that resonate with the people, to connect one generation from another. We want to work with communities in the local, what we call areas, our heartlands, to get them to be involved in the documentation, the presentation, the promotion of heritage. In particular, we want to deepen our engagement with youth because they're so important in transmitting the knowledge to the next generation. And we want to get them to be involved at an early age, you know, get them to appreciate and help work with us to promote cultural heritage. The second area is about industry. I think COVID has really shown that you know, many of these small businesses that were so important, unfortunately, sometimes we may have taken them for granted, um, were lost during the COVID pandemic. It was a serious wake-up call for us. And we wanted to do more. With, that's why we started the, a lot of the mapping projects, the documentation, spreading the word, the awards. And we want to do more of such areas through financial grants that can help support many of our businesses to try to innovate, to try to stay relevant with the changing times, the changing technology. We want to create new opportunities to showcase traditional crafts, um, to change the image that people have of traditional crafts as well. It's not just something that's in the past, 
or something that's so relevant, so important in today's context as well. And to sum up the end of our presentation, I'd like to just go back to the themes of Wikimania this year, which is on diversity, collaboration, and the future. I've shared and talked about the diversity of cultures that we have in Singapore. And as well, I'm sure many of the cities and countries that you come from have very rich and diverse uh, heritage. But it's so important that we all put in a little bit of effort as consumers, as knowledge generators, you know, as individuals or as networks or groups to try to come together to safeguard, to collaborate and find ways to safeguard uh, this important living heritage of ours. Because it's up to us to ensure that this living heritage that our forefathers have and the people who have come before us have passed down to us and that we have a duty to make sure that we pass on this legacy to the future generation of ours as well. With that, thank you very much. Happy to take some questions on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirk. You'll already have some questions submitted by our online participants in front of you. For okay. those in the room, if you could see the mics uh, in the middle of the aisles, if you could head there to ask your questions, that would be great. Thank you. Maybe I'll just ask if there's anybody in the room who wants to ask a question first before we take the questions online. We take the online. Oh, yes. Is this on there? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kirk. Great, great talk. And I think just to remind folks in the audience, this is not just Kirk giving a talk today. We've had, you know, in the previous months, engagement with youth of Singapore to contribute. You saw some of the photos to, um, to Wikimedia Commons and to Wikidata. And there was actually a whole youth competition here. So thank you so much. One of the things that we kind of struggle with in the Wiki community with intangible uh, heritage is um, we have pretty strong policies around verifiability and a lot of our policies towards sourcing and verifiability tend to be uh, more oriented towards traditional academic sources. So we've always struggled with how to properly incorporate intangible heritage into Wikipedia mm. when a lot of it is like folk culture or stories mm. or audio mm. or, um, you know, uh, things that don't traditionally meet that standard of academic mm. sourcing. Mm. So I'm wondering if you have any advice or any insights into how we can not necessarily overcome that, but how might we better uh, populate Wikipedia and its projects with intangible heritage if that is kind of our, our our understanding of sourcing. Do we need to change our thoughts about sourcing? Mm. What are your ideas about mm. that? Mm. Thank you. I think there's two immediate thoughts that come to my mind. The first one is something that we've been trying to work on, even here in Singapore, is that there's a problem, there's a genuine lack of um, research in, in documentation, academic areas, and, and we're trying to, to do more on that um, by encouraging and working with our universities, the researchers to do more, to publish. That's why we have publications that we're trying to encourage as well. But that takes a long time. For us, I, I think there may be a need to, to, to look at how academic sources are not the only source of truth, especially for, for topics like this. Because if you go back, like I mentioned, there's no one source of truth in this area of living heritage. Uh, and it's, it's all in the living experiences, the stories that we tell. So I don't have an easy solution because the, 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 the source of truth is also very important. But I think what we try to do here is to try to you know, show the stories through videos, um, you know, which is really the, the individual's expressions. But at the same time, I think as na na the National Heritage Board, sometimes we say, yeah, it's, it's the person's um, um, a, a viewpoints. We may not necessarily uh, endorse or agree with it. Uh, that, that's, um, I guess, a, a way that we try to manage it. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a way that, I, I guess, helps to broaden the diversity of stories, but at the same time, um, makes it personal. It's not from a, a viewpoint from the organization, but there's a viewpoint from the individual who has said it. Uh, and there may be counter voices that say, oh, I don't agree. In, it has a different viewpoint, but that's, that's possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see a few uh, questions here. Maybe I'll move on to take them. 
The first question is how can we work together with Wikimania to increase support in Singapore? Actually, that's a, that's a very uh, important thing that we're trying to do. So when, when, when I first got the invitation to be, to be here to speak and to support the event, I, I straight away say, told my colleagues, yeah, let's do it then. It's a way I think we've been trying to see how we can work with partners and communities. And it's such a natural partnership, but admittedly, we haven't done so much in the past, but we see so much opportunities now, you know, having come to Wikimania to be part of it, talking to you know, many different people over the last uh, one, two days, and, and even before that. There's a lot of areas that we can work on. One is already the photo competition that we have, but again, the stories, you know, if we can find ways. There's so much cultural heritage here in Singapore that needs to be documented. It's not just the living heritage, but the buildings. You know, there are photo, if you can get more photos of the buildings, the stories, the information, the history of it, it's a very rich resource that can be used not just by people here in Singapore, but people around the world can understand us better. So the short answer is yes, there's, I, I think we've been starting these conversations. There's a lot of opportunities that we can work with and we'll be exploring um, that um, over the next uh, weeks and months ahead. Okay. Second question, can you share your experiences with sustaining community engagement around preserving this history, particularly amongst young people? Uh, I was just having a conversation yesterday with uh, my colleagues. We say, Singaporeans sometimes they are very passive. I think they are very passionate about heritage, especially the young people, because there's this sense that we have developed so much in the past. We may have, um, there's a lot of rapid change. They're trying to rediscover themselves in this world, uh, what makes them Singaporeans, what roots them. So they have a very deep passion. But at the same time, um, around the room, nobody wants to put their hands up and say, yes, I'll, I'll be the leader, I want to form a group, I want to bring everybody together. Uh, and that's why when we do the citizen engagement project, there's, there's still a little bit of coordination that we did. Uh, but we have started um, a youth panel to try to, um, that is, involves members of uh, youths, working adults, people in the university, to come forward to share their ideas and we also want to, use, through the platform, get them to implement their projects as well. So that's just one way that we try to engage and uh, get people to be involved in, in, in some of these heritage projects. So just, uh, that's just one example. Uh, there's many I can list, so if, you, if those of you in the room, you can catch me later, I can share a bit more. But there's a few other questions, and uh, time is running down, so I'll try to uh, um, answer them as well. The next question is, can you say more about using technology to get people to understand how heritage can be relevant today? Yes, uh, at the NHB, as we've been trying to do a lot more of the technology, um, use technology to help guide our work. Of course, a lot of information we have online is online, but we also uh, have digital versions of, our, for example, our exhibitions that we do in the museum. Um, and also digital projects, for example, scanning of buildings to document them. Uh, in the same way that in the past, buildings were documented through maps, photos, we now have the technology to document using 3D technology. Um, and these are just some of the many different ways um, that technology can help. But also, let's not just forget, social media is also a form of technology, and that's been extremely helpful in getting the word out to people whether it's to promote um, heritage, to promote an event, to get people to understand something, but also to bring online communities together to talk about and contribute about um, their, their own ideas about heritage as well. So there's many, many different ways, but I, I would also like to emphasize that technology is a good enabler, it's important, but let's not, just, let's not forget the importance of the physical dimension as well. Culture, like I mentioned in the presentation, is to bring people together. That people-to-people -people interaction, that stories that the older generation tells to the younger generation, the skills that are passed down, that is difficult to replace using technology. I would say technology helps enable connections to be made, knowledge to be retained and passed down, but there is still the need for some form of physical kind of uh, contact, discussions, debate, and that's something that's not replaceable. 
The next question, does part of this work and involve closing knowledge gaps, people, happenings, experiences that have been left out of history? If yes, how do you work to fill these gaps? Yes, there's a lot of, um, I think history and heritage is so rich. History, of course, is the, you know, there's a lot of um, important things that have happened in the past, but also the interpretation, how do we uh, interpret heritage and history in our, our modern day context, the different perspectives. And we try to do that through different, different ways. The exhibitions that we have, for example, in the museums can only show so much. We have a physical limitation on the space. There's a physical limit to how much information they can, they can present, how much information that one is comfortable to consume. But what is important is sometimes to complement, for example, these exhibitions, these experiences. We have to bring in people, the experts, for example, the, the academics, people who have lived through the experiences to come together to share the diverse viewpoints um, and, and, and to share the different perspectives. I think the, the wide diversity is, is very important. Uh, on intangible and living heritage, we try to show a variety of, um, of different cultures as well here in Singapore. Uh, for those who are familiar, I think in Singapore, we, we often classify ourselves broadly as Chinese, Malay, Indian, and others. But at the NHB, we try to look at diversity beyond that. I think those are important, but there's also diverse communities. For example, there's the uh, Zoroastrian communities here uh, who has been here for, for long. There's a small Jewish community that has been part of our history since the very early days of the colonial period. And there's many, many other diverse um, cultures, and we try to celebrate that. And I think that's when working with communities, with networks, are very important to bring about this uh, diversity of views, of change, of perspective, of diverse stories that we have. I have three minutes, and I have one last question. Um, what would you say is the biggest challenge that you have encountered in preserving and elevating this history? And how have you worked to overcome it? I think the biggest challenge is well, racing against time here in Singapore. <laughs> Why do I say that? There's a lot of change happening. Um, I'm not just talking about physical change. There's a physical change that, that happens. Yes, physical environment, new buildings change, phys the shops disappear and they're replaced by others. But there's also the, so much change that I talked about earlier. The pace of life, you know, the technology advancement is so rapid. A lot of um, cultural practitioners find it difficult to adapt. How, how does their cultural practice that they have been practicing, the craft that they've been making for decades, how, how do they adapt to this new environment? They have to be savvy in social media. They have to be able to relate to a younger generation who consumes things differently. They have to relate, in Singapore, they have to relate to a younger generation that may speak a different language from them. You know, because English is now the, English or Singlish is now the, the norm, right? But in the past, people who have lived through that, it's not the same. They have made, speak a different language. So the challenge is this change. How do we get people to, to bridge that change, to bring people together, to help them you know, stay relevant, to help the young people see the relevance of it. It's not an old-fashioned thing that, oh, my mom used to do it and uh, doesn't matter to me anymore, but it is, like I say, getting them to be, you know, understand this is part of identity, this is where they come from, what they are. And I think that's a challenge, but it's something that keeps me energized, keeps me awake, um, and I continue to be very uh, passionate about the work that I do. So thank you very much. I think the time is up. Thank you very much.